Well, I'll say a little bit about uh, what I was doing when I met Alex, since he brought it up. Um, my, my stock in trade at that time as a developer was uh, IDE expertise. And so I would go to conferences and demonstrate that I knew more key combinations in IntelliJ IDEA than anybody else in the world. And I was the fastest, most devilish, most nefarious user uh, of IDE technology. And uh, those who now work with me at Cognitech must really find that amusing because they know that I can't sort of type my way out of a paper bag uh, with the current tool set. Um, I've thought about how to, um, how to actually do the closure version of that, right? So you would, you would come to a conference and you would set up a hammock and you would um, you'd close your eyes and people would watch you for half an hour and then you'd say, aha, and, and, uh, and stand up and leave. So I do think if anybody wants to do that, I think it would be a real blast if somebody would, would film one of the coding katas where um, you just play classical music for 20 minutes and there's a blank screen, and then you say aha and type in the whole thing, and, and it's all correct. So, uh, but to turn to more serious matters, I wanna talk to you today about data.freshen. Uh, and, and before I do that, just to talk about uh, Freshen itself. And so I'm gonna rewind the clock several years, and let's see if the clicker works, uh, to when we started to build Datomic. If you think about Datomic in particular, or any database in general, there are lots of different places that data needs to move around. Uh, you have transactions, obviously, and that's you know, whatever data the user uh, puts into the system and also whatever you report back to the user as a result of a transaction. Uh, you have data being exchanged for coordination, so keeping track of the different processes of the system so that you can uh, maintain availability or maintain asset guarantees or whatever. Uh, databases have logs. So you want to be able to write the most recent change uh, in an efficient way. Um, databases have catalogs, so you can walk up to them and ask you know, what's in you. Um, uh, in the long term, a database is really only storage if it's just the log, right? If you just threw stuff down you know, under keys or in a tree and could look them up later, I wouldn't really call that a database. But if you have, so you want to have indexes, which is yet another different kind of data. Uh, and uh, because Datomic is built on closure principles, uh, there is a distinction between values and refs that sometimes even makes its way to how you think about uh, the binary encoding of data. So when we started working on Datomic, uh, I remember my first year of Datomic very vividly. Um, uh, picture a scene in a movie where a harsh taskmaster is making you know, wax on, wax off, except that uh, the harsh taskmaster was making me read like 150 academic papers uh, on Datalog in the mornings and in the afternoons, assessing different uh, binary data encoding schemes that existed out in the world. Right? We certainly wanted to have uh, uh, approaches that um, uh, ideally met all the uh, characteristics that we needed, uh, were open source, were well known and well established. Uh, after uh, assessing the things that we had out there uh, in the open source world that were well known and well established, and doing some performance benchmarks on some of them, we realized that that was not going to work and set out to uh, create Freshen. One of the things we did not know at that time was were we in a game of having one scheme for binary encoding or n schemes? In other words, those different requirements that Datomic had, was there gonna have to be something that was you know, specifically optimized for log and another thing that was specifically optimized for transactions? And remember that we're talking here about um, data in motion and data at rest, right? So we're talking about putting data on the wire, but we're also talking about uh, where data is gonna live long term. And so happily, uh, after a, a longer time than, than I would have thought initially, uh, we came out of that with a, a binary encoding format called Freshen. I wanna start by saying about Freshen that uh, I will slip up and say the word serialization, but I don't like the word serialization uh, to talk about what we're doing here. Uh, and the reason that I don't, and if you go and read the Wikipedia article on serialization, or, or maybe if you're really rigorous, even go further than that, uh, and read something else about serialization, I don't know, everything I know about programming I learned on Wikipedia, right? I feel like that's probably enough. Uh, but if you go and read about what people talk about serialization, it's obvious when people think about serialization that objects are driving, right? People are thinking, oh man, I've got these great objects, and I gotta go stuff them somewhere. And so really where they go is kind of second class in your thinking when you start by saying uh, serialization. 
And furthermore, uh, obviously just given the heritage that we have as an industry, serialization is, uh, gets into the business of object graphs and references and that kind of stuff, which we didn't need any of uh, to build Datomic. And if you wanted to have that kind of thing, you'd want to have it as a separate layer uh, you know, above uh, whatever you did uh, to deal with data. So instead of using the word serialization, we're going to use the word data encoding. And the difference at the highest level is just a philosophical one, right? The data is driving. So you're thinking in terms of what is this binary data going to be? Because when somebody comes to your system six years from now, what are they going to have? Right? They're going to have the binary data that's at rest somewhere that you can give them, or they're going to have binary data that you're going to send them uh, on the wire. And so when you come at it with these uh, presumptions, uh, you end up in a lot of different places uh, than you would if you thought just in terms of serialization. In particular, uh, you don't have a consumers must understand everything attitude. A lot of times with serialization, the big goal is fidelity, right? So I can take X over here and get back exactly X over there. And obviously it's nice to do that when you want to do that, uh, but it's more important to say that over there cares about your data and they don't care about the way you thought about it. And so you'd like to look at it in a different way. Uh, also, given uh, the well-known biases in this community about values versus objects, uh, we didn't need objects and we didn't need identity. We almost got there with a, an existing protocol called Hessian. And uh, these, are, these are not my slide bullets. I just copied these uh, from the Hessian webpage. This is the design requirements uh, of Hessian. And there's a lot of really good stuff in here. It must self-describe the seri ser uh, serialized types. So in other words, there's not going to be any, any external schema or context. It has to be language independent. It has to be readable and writable in a single pass. It has to be compact. It has to be simple. And I like the benefit of simple here, so that it can be effectively tested and implemented. Right? Their, their presumption is if you don't make things simple, it'll be impossible to actually make them at all, which is uh, not a bad starting place. Um, and then, finally, fast. And then there are some details about you know, supporting uh, various other things. Uh, so Hessian is pretty cool. Uh, that being said, if you read further than these requirements, uh, they also came strongly from the Java space. And so you can find other places in the documents where you know, supporting EJB in a first class way is a requirement and so forth. So, so there's object semantics. Oh, we shouldn't laugh. We should feel sad, right? But so object semantics uh, you know, really became important uh, in Hessian. And so uh, Hessian is, does a lot of things that you would want, and it does several things then um, that we didn't need. So Freshen uh, is a refresh of the ideas in Hessian, hence the name. Uh, another thing that you'll see a lot of similarity to when we talk about uh, Freshen is Eden. And this, orig this slide originally said, as of yesterday, Freshen is like Eden. And, and Rich's really helpful uh, review of my slide deck said, Eden is like Freshen. Uh, that was the one piece of feedback I got. Thanks, Rich. Um, so, but the idea here is that the design proceeded in this order. So a lot of you are probably familiar with Eden because, uh, because Eden was actually launched, right? And there, were, there was a web page and you know, a conversation about it and a blog post and, and what have you. And also Eden was, uh, was uh, addressing a more immediately visible need for closure users who are already committed to the path of using closure data for serialization. But if you understand the ideas behind Eden, then Freshit is going to line up with that uh, pretty precisely. And the only reason that I invert the order here when I'm talking about them is that the design work that led to Eden was actually the design work for Freshen. So Freshen was designed and implemented, and then out of that there was some head scratching and, oh, we could take these ideas back and retroactively apply them to closure data structures. And it's already lined up, you know, not surprisingly, because the design work is done you know, over time by the same team. So both Eden and Freshen are language neutral. So obviously we're here because we're passionate about closure, but it's super important when you think about data uh, to try to be as broad-minded as possible. You know, whatever language we're using 10 years from now, I hope it doesn't bear any resemblance to the ones we're using now. But it would be nice if we could still read the data that we saved. So, so being language neutral is super important, and I'm going to come back to that. Um, we want things to be self-describing, and this is really consistent with uh, uh, being in a dynamic world, right? We're not going to have a lot of pre-negotiation. In fact, we're going to have no pre-negotiation about what data can look like, which means anything can show up. Um, a specific example of where this is an important requirement uh, 
uh, in a programming language like Clojure is that you can say anything, right? It's a programming language. And so uh, trying to uh, pre-describe what you can say could really become a pain in the ass. Uh, on the datomic side, an example would be transaction functions, right? Uh, if we had to have a type system for transaction functions, we could descend into endless wankery, right? We could, you know, two years from now, we still wouldn't have transaction functions in Datomic, but we would have a great discussion and maybe a couple of novel innovations in type theory, which would be cool, but we, would, we wouldn't be doing any transaction functions during that time. So, uh, obviously, we're talking in terms of immutable values. Uh, namespaces are going to be a first-class idea, uh, you know, floating along with the ideas of symbols and keywords. Um, Freshen is extensible in exactly the same kind of way that Eden is, or vice versa which is that you can make new named things that are recursively defined in terms of the old things, uh, which means that you can compose things. And finally, these formats are batteries included, uh, the idea being that they have enough stuff that at least on day one you're not, oh yeah, you forgot to put numbers, <laughs> you know, or something like that uh, in the format. That being said, given that they have all these things in common, it's of course reasonable to ask why are there two of them? Uh, and the answer is really performance. So uh, right. Eden is designed for readability by the second best computing substrate we have out there, which is people. Um, and so the internet being the first one. And so, so it's got a lot of, uh, of bloat in it. Uh, but Freshen is a binary protocol. Um, yeah, along with Hessian, it's driven by a bytecode spec. So the way that Freshen actually works is that if you are of type X, then there's going to be a bytecode that says, you know, type X follows. Um, and we'll come back to, well, how is that extensible in just a second. Uh, Freshen is also aware of primitives. So uh, a big idea in the Clojure world is that we are aware of the platforms that we're going to run on. We do not want Clojure to be a private island. And it's a fact that the platforms that we run on bless groups of numbers that run in the range from long min value to long max value. Those numbers are privileged above other numbers, which is really unfair considering that that actually is 0% of the total set of integers out there. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, they are, they are treated importantly and specially. And if you're doing high performance stuff, you may actually want to be able to go to and from uh, platform primitives. Finally, and this was certainly the part that was most interesting to me when we did the design and implementation work, and this part we'll go into in, in the most detail later in the talk, uh, Freshen allows you to do domain-specific compression. So if you know something about your domain, you can actually, when you're writing, write a very small piece of code that compresses amazingly your data, and readers don't have to know that you did it. So this is a really cool property. You can think about how you would go about doing that, you know, before I show you the design. You want to make a system where writers can say, I know how to compress the data, and I'm going to tell you how to do that. And readers don't know. I'm not going to write a custom reader at all, and that's just going to work. Now, I'm not going to talk specifically about other binary encoding frameworks or serialization frameworks too much, because um, it just invites unnecessary flame wars. And the important thing here is to be specific about what we're trying to do what our goals and objectives are in Freshen and in Eden, uh, and then sort of compare that to what the available choices are. So there are a lot of temptations out there when you have to, if you are working on, and as I have a lot, working on a consulting project, and your job right now is to take some data that you have in your favorite programming language and put it somewhere, right? There are a lot of temptations uh, to avoid if you have the goals that I stated before. Now, it's always important to keep the goals in mind. So I want to avoid the flame wars later where people are saying, well, I have different goals. Well, those are, that's totally reasonable. Given the goals that we have, though, given the goal of language neutrality, a whole swath of things that are out there are right out. Right? There are a lot of tools out there that can say, I'm going to encode in such a way that everybody forever will know that this was made by Java. And they will have to be aware of Java. Or everybody forever will know that this was made by JavaScript. And I will have to be aware of JavaScript. Uh, that is right out, uh, because we want to be language neutral, and we don't want to, and, and you might say, well, maybe I can very carefully do something that's driven by Java, but if I really keep my wits about me, I won't screw up the other guys. I don't believe it, right? If you don't start uh, with a presumption of, I want to be able to reach different languages, uh, you're not going to get there by accident or, or by a random walk. Uh, another thing, uh, a sufficiency requirement, uh, 
is to have sufficiently rich types. And here I will use a, a concrete example. Uh, if your binary encoding or text encoding or serialization, whatever you call it, if your mechanism for dealing with data does not have uh, a system for expressing types that is as rich as where you're going, as your language, uh, and doesn't have a way to extend it to get there, then the job is not actually done, right? Which means that every other statement you make about such a thing is entirely suspect. So let's imagine, for example, that JSON was the fastest and in every way the best language for communicating data, uh, in every other way. Uh, JSON does not have a rich set of types, and its types are not extensible. Therefore, you actually haven't finished turning JSON back into data until you do extra work to actually get your types back, right? If you have a date or a, a richly described object or a, a UUID or anything, there, are no, there is no first class support for those things in JSON, which means that when you say, I have this benchmark showing that this thing is incredible, you haven't even actually done the job yet, right? Because in order to do the job, you have to actually get back to your, where you want to be in your program. And of course, if you haven't done the job yet, that job ends up being done at the edges of thousands of different programs. Literally a thousand fold reduction in programmer productivity. And I'm not joking, right? This is a big deal, right? If you, get, if you leave out something, if you're not sufficient and everybody has to make things sufficient in an ad hoc way, right, by adding these little bits at the edges, then you're gonna have really real problems. Another place where you can have problems is having said we want to be rich, we're never going to be, well, that kind of came out fun. Um, we're never going to be uh, rich enough in our type system to express everything somebody else is going to want to express. So you want to be extensible. But the extension point can't be entirely arbitrary, right? It can't just be, okay, now here you can do anything. Because at that point, you can write something that everybody else can't read. And a great example of this uh, failing would be Java serialization. Right? In Java serialization, there's a, you know, there's a trap door that you can go through that says, I'm going to do whatever I want here. And the minute you do that, then you and all future readers are in lockstep. Right? You're now coupled together uh, around those choices that you made. So extensions points have to be defined in terms of the core semantics in such a way that somebody who doesn't want to play is not screwed up by trying to read the data that you've made. Uh, finally, and perhaps most importantly, uh, being self-describing. What we want to avoid here is contextual description or schemas. So in other words, I send you a piece of data and you know how to read it because we had an out-of-band understanding that was not communicated in any you know, electronic way, or we had an out-of-band understanding that was explicitly communicated. So in, before I communicate with you, I must send you a schema that tells you uh, how I'm going to communicate with you. And it's perfectly fine to build systems this way, right? They are going to have the ability to get to some performance characteristics you couldn't otherwise, right? If we have the ability to pre-negotiate in detail how we're going to talk about things, right, then I can tell you, for example, the number 42 encodes Wikipedia, all of it, right? So whenever I want to communicate to you Wikipedia, I can just send you the number 42, which is really efficient compression. Right? But if you have to have that kind of out-of-band communication, you know, you haven't really communicated at some point, right? Because it's really, where is, where is the actual communication? It's there and it's in the out-of-band communication. From a functional programming perspective, it also makes everything kind of stateful, right? In order to understand your message X, I have to understand some pre-message Y. And a lot of times, if this context is not done with an explicit schema, it's just done by agreement, then there's a schema that never got written down anywhere. And so the actual secret of understanding your data is not even uh, carefully specified or encoded. So there are a lot of different choices out there for where you could put data that fail these requirements. That does not mean that those choices are terrible. It does mean specifically that they fail these requirements. And so if these requirements are important to you as they were to us, uh, you might end up where we ended up. So that being said, we still care about efficiency. So given that we don't have the tricks of saying, I'm going to communicate to you in advance that the number 42 means the entire content of the Wikipedia, uh, what efficiency tricks do we have left? Uh, well, we can obviously, by doing just extra work, we can make some things that work with the primitives and the arrays that are available on existing platforms. Uh, Bytecode languages themselves uh, are efficient. I mean, we came to Hessian to begin with because it was efficient. Uh, and then there are encoding strategies for dealing with performance. So uh, you can do packed encodings where you say, I'm going to encode a small value, uh, and I'm actually going to encode the type and the value in the bytecode. 
So for example, the number five, with the type information that says it's the number five in Freshen is encoded as, wait for it, the number five. Um, and in fact, the first 64 integers are encoded that way. Zero through 63, I guess, are all encoded to the int, which is me. And so that's a packed encoding, because you're encoding two facts in the bytecode, right? You're encoding, here comes an int, and here's the int that's coming. Uh, so that's packed encoding. Uh, on the other side, another performance concern that I haven't alluded to yet is that it's important to be able to run in streaming contexts where you might not have uh, enough memory to process everything all at once. And so chunked encoding says that we're never going to make anything very big, right? You can send a terabyte of data through a fresh and stream, but we're never going to make any individual piece of that very large. And so the kinds of things that are variable length uh, in Freshen get chunked up such that you never get bigger than, say, a 64K byte of something. And so you could process arbitrarily huge things without having to do anything special uh, at the b uh, binary encoding level to worry about it. And then finally, and the biggest one, right, the superpower is the domain-aware caching, which we'll talk about in a minute. So I'm going to show you the Java API first, uh, and then we'll, we'll look at the Clojure API. So it's really simple. If you want to write something, you have an instance of a Freshen writer, which is on top of Java's writers, uh, and you write an object. Um, you also have the ability to read an object, which again is just read object. Um, write as allows you, if you've looked at Eden before and looked at tagged things in Eden, it's the same idea here. You can say, I'm going to write this with a name. So when somebody reads it back later, uh, they can say, oh, this isn't the map A maps to one, this is the map A maps to one named encoding or grade or whatever it's going to be named. In addition to these, there are also uh, a pair of streaming writers. So if you have uh, a collection of things of arbitrary size, not known advan in advanced, you can say begin closed list. This writes a bytecode that says read everything else and just accumulate them up into a list until you get to another code which says I'm done with my list now, which is the endless code, which is the other one. Um, and the other thing that comes into play when you start doing streaming, and we'll talk more about this later, is that uh, the domain-aware caching can be reset. So if you have a long stream of data, um, one of the great things about caching is once you sort of say, I'm going to say 42 points to the Wikipedia, then later you can just say 42, except that if the stream is really long, you don't want to have to read all the way back to the beginning of the stream in order to understand the caching. So you could have a long stream of things, but you can have sort of caching subdomains within that stream where the caching is defined to mean different things. Then you have the mechanism for making new types in terms of old. And so this is uh, actually the handler that's built into Freshen for writing big decimals. And so what you do is, in order to write a big decimal, you register a callback function, which because we're in Java, we don't have functions, so it's goofy interface stuff. Uh, but you register a callback function, and then you write a tag, so big decimal, and then you say the big decimals come in two pieces, and then you write whatever those pieces are. And it's the job of a reader then to say, oh, that's a named thing. I need to know how to recognize that and do something with it. Uh, in support of this building new types in terms of old is the entire stack of making primitive things. So what this allows you to do is to say, I'm going to have one carefully structured type, which is the very bottom of my system from a performance perspective. And that type actually is, you know, maybe in closure terms, it might be a def type. Right? So it has a bunch of primitive fields in it, or it might be a def type of arrays or something like that. And I'm going to write a write handler for that that works directly at the primitive layer so I don't have to do any boxing while I'm doing serialization. Now, all this sounds great, except for the minute I add big decimal to my system, what happens to you if, if I didn't give you a reader for it? Or if you're working on a different implementation of Freshen that doesn't have that reader? And what you get back is an interface called tagged. So anytime you see a tag like big deck and you say, oh, I don't know what a big deck is. No one gave me a handler for that. Then the underlying implementation of Freshen is responsible for handing back your language equivalent of this interface, here shown in Java. An interface that says, I am a tagged thing with this name, with this, many, uh, with this value, with these pieces inside of it. And so what this does is it gets intermediaries out of the business of having to understand things. Right? This is the opposite of what I said in the narcissistic design talk where I talked about you ought to use static typing so that intermediaries have to understand everything. Right? This is, I'm going to pass something through 17 intermediaries. All of them are going to read and write this thing. And when they read and write it, they're just going to get a level of indirection that says, I have a tagged thing 
I don't understand this, which is fine. I can do something with it uh, and pass it on to the next guy. So, domain caching. The idea here is that in the Freshen bytecode spec, there are a number of bytecodes that are reserved for cache references. And so when you're writing things into a stream, you can say, write this cached. It will write it once. It will then assign it a code. Just for simplicity, I'll say 42, although that actually is not a cache code. Um, but let's say that we assign the cache code 42. Then when we see that data structure again, rather than writing it, we can write 42. And the thing about this is that the caching mechanism is fully dynamic. It's the writer who chooses what to cache. Right, when I'm writing an object, I can say, write this object, and then there's a Boolean flag, and make a cache code for this. And that caching mechanism is entirely generic from the point of view of readers. Right, so the caching mechanism is already baked in to both reading and writing, and all writers have to do is select what kinds of things are going to be cached. So what kind of compression can you get from this? It depends. Right? If you had time to write the entire Wikipedia and then you wanted to write it again, you could claim an extraordinarily uh, big compression ratio, but it's going to allow you uh, to get compression uh, proportional to your own knowledge of your own data. Uh, in my experience, this always beats uh, generic compression if you're not shipping random data. Right? If your data has any structure to it that you can talk about, then you can talk about that structure uh, in terms of caching um, and beat generic compression. Uh, to give a specific example, um, uh, I would find, doing some testing over the last couple of weeks, that uh, you could beat a generic serialization scheme by at least double, right? So if a generic serialization scheme serializes to 500K, uh, you would get to 250K. And that is even if you then turn around and compress both. So even if you then turned around and used gzip or snappy or something like that, right? Because those things are going to do a decent job of sucking out similarity in a generic way. Um, now, if you don't compress, if you just let uh, Freshen's domain-aware um, compression complete with non-compression, then I could claim arbitrary victories right, over, uh, over other forms. Right? I, could, I could show you examples where you got 10x or 100x or 1,000x uh, compression ratio, but a more realistic number is probably 2x. That's pretty big, though. Right? If you have a whole system that you can make half as big as it was, that's not nothing. So what this looks like uh, from the perspective of someone who wants to write data is there is a write object method that just takes the cache flag that says, do I want to cache this object? There's also, this is kind of advanced, an interface that you can implement on an object that says, um, I want to nominate um, someone in my stead for caching. So get object to cache. And the idea here is if you have a very deeply nested thing, you might not be able to specify at the top what kind of caching you want to do. You're not going to write all the code to do that. You're going to have that deeply nested thing be smart enough to say, I nominate uh, my caching guy. To give one particular example of how this works, uh, Datomic uh, stores datums, right? Entity, attribute, value, transaction, um, assert or retract. And one of the obvious questions that people would ask is, well, how can you efficiently store the time that every fact in your system happened? Right, that's given, given the granularity of storage here, given that it's stored with every single really tiny fact, right? These datums are smaller than rows in a database or documents or objects in a graph store. So how are you going to efficiently do that? And, and this is literally what happens, right? When you write, except it's not written in Java, um, but when you write uh, a datomic datum, there are various places in the system where the time is cached. And of course, in a transaction, the property of a transaction is every datum in that transaction is going to have the same time. Right, so writing that T, uh, that thing's going to be cached once, uh, and then it's going to be the same bytecode after that. So first off, you get this compression ratio, and secondly, the repeating of the cache code itself probably lends itself to more compression uh, in any sort of follow-on compression algorithm. So that's the world as of three weeks ago, um, which is to say that uh, Freshen is out there. It's an open source library. There's a reference implementation in Java. There's an implementation in C Sharp. Uh, uh, now, as of later today, there is a idiomatic closure library for doing this stuff called data.freshen. So this was something that, that uh, we did not release uh, because it didn't exist, um, uh, but now it does. And so the idea behind data.freshen is that it's an idiomatic closure wrapper for everything I just said. Um, in particular, it has built-in handlers 
for all the stuff you're likely to run into in Clojure, with some painful exceptions, which I'll come back to. Um, and it also has domain compression for def records, both as an efficiency for def records and also as a template that you could use to look at how to do uh, domain compression. Uh, one thing I want to say about this, uh, I do a lot of telling people that simple is important and that easy is nice too, but really simple is important. Um, and every once in a while, I probably should stand up in front of people and say, look, we made something that was both simple and easy instead of simple and screw you, which is, you know, sometimes, <laughs> which sometimes happens. So this is actually simple and easy, right? So the easy API just says I want to read stuff and I want to write stuff. Well, those APIs are literally write and read. Um, then those are actually, that, those are wrappers. Those are the ease wrappers on top of the simple parts. So create reader and create writer is the underlying API and then there's read and write and so forth. And all of those things can be composed. In particular, any of those things in the Freshen namespace can be composed with adding your own handlers on either the write side or the read side. So that's the mechanism to extensibility. There are a number of types that you need to worry about. Uh, if you want to have fresh and work in the closure ecosystem, uh, you probably do not want to get back, um, well, we should talk about this, right? Imagine what the Java implementation has to do. The Java implementation of Freshen promises that it's going to deliver you values, which means that the things that it gives you back have to be immutable. But it's written in Java, and it's not going to drag in all of Clojure's persistent data structures. So if you go and look at what the Freshen Java library does, is when it's reading back complex data structures, it makes a mutable collection, and then it calls dot, what is it, to unmodifiable collection or whatever on the end. Um, as a Clojure programmer, you're going to be really ticked off by that. Um, in particular, you're going to be ticked off at, in the case of maps, because you then cannot associate onto them uh, or do any of the other stuff you want to do with persistent data structures. So one of the things that data.freshen does is read back, uh, reads back collections into the persistent data structures that you would expect. Then there are a number of types that are particular to Clojure that have no standard representation in Java. So even though they can be supported in Freshen, you can't really see them in a nice way in Java. So keyword, symbol, and ratio. Um, the only thing interesting to say about those is they just work. Um, so if you pass in those things, you can do so. Um, then um, big int is special for reasons that, as a user, you really don't care about, but just to mention it for completeness, uh, big int is special because Clojure has its own representation uh, for big int, separate from big integer, um, to deal with uh, sort of all the nefarious issues around hashing inequality um, in Java versus in Clojure. Um, so uh, big int um, is actually extended on the read side in data.fresh, and so you actually get back Clojure big ints. So you see things round tripping um, to what you would expect. And then finally, def records cache their keys. And also there's an extension point you can do to selectively cache values. So the idea here is if you had, for example, a, an address book with a, th an a, th a thousand entries in it, and the address book, you know, each entry had eight keys, and you encoded that as JSON, you would repeat those eight keys on the first address entry, you'd repeat those eight keys on the second one, and so on and so forth, uh, ad infinitum. Uh, in the def record caching, all those names are cached, and so the representation of them in subsequent records is one byte each. Um, and so again, right, it's totally bogus, right? I can generate example data that shows you a thousand-fold compression, right, just by making enough key names and making them big enough, but you get the idea. And here's what that looks like in closure code. So this is the actual write handler uh, for def records in data.freshen. And so the two important things here are that when you write the actual symbol for the class, that's marked as cache true. And then when you mark the actual uh, keyword name of the keys in the map, uh, that's also marked as cache true. And then on the read side, what happens is you read back the record name and the map that you're going to use to construct the record. And then you look and see if you actually know that constructor. So one possibility in a closure program, of course, is that I had a def record that you don't have. Right, so when I, when, I, you know, when I pass the desk record in, you go back to read it later, it doesn't exist. What should we do? Well, what the default implementation currently does, and this is subject to discussion among this group, but is it says, look, if I can construct the record, I will. If not, I'm taking my hands off of it, and I'm going to give you back a tagged object that says, look, here's a record for which you don't have the implementation. You've got to go figure out what you want to do with it. In some cases, you don't care, right? You're an intermediary, so you're saying, fine, that's okay with me. I'll pass that on. Now, the great thing about this extension mechanism is you might disagree with me completely about what to do here. 
One possible choice is, you know what, I don't even care about records on any consumer side, so I want them just to look like maps. Well, fine, right? And, you know, replace this handler, which you can do on all these functions, replace this handler with one that instead of making tagged objects, just says, you know, whenever I see a record, I'm just going to uh, dumb it down to a map on this side. And that the, the important thing here is that the decision making here is completely decoupled between the reader and the writer, right? There is nothing that I can say as a reader that's going to put you in a position as a writer, or, or as a writer, that's going to put you in a position as a reader to say, well, I'm stuck. Right? The most stuck you can get is to say, I don't really understand this, so I'm going to sort of put a little box around it and pass it down the line. The extension mechanism in data.freshen is data-driven. So if you've ever looked at protocol extension, there are these higher-level helpers, but then at the very bottom, there's the function that works with maps. Uh, it's similar to that idea. So the actual registration of new handlers uh, is done uh, via maps of type names to handlers for those names. And I'll show you one example. Um, so this is defining my own extended handler. So I have a, a def record called splotch. Uh, it's from a children's book. Um, and uh, splotch has in it a color. It turns out that color itself in splotches is always a keyword. So the value of color is a good candidate for caching. Right? That's not always true. Some things in, rec in a def record might be a good candidate for caching. Some things might not. Uh, but the value is a good candidate for caching. So there's this helper function here, field caching writer, that says, give me back a new writer for records that will selectively cache the values of certain fields. And it caches them based on a predicate. So the predicate here says, if the field name is color, I want to cache that as well. Um, there's more details here that, that get into things that are perhaps less completely considered, and again, sort of op uh, subject to change over the next couple of weeks. Um, you take that map, you pass it to associative lookup, which says, given a closure data structure, make the thing that Freshen wants to see, right? It doesn't think in terms of the map interface. And then inheritance lookup um, does magic on top of that to say, when I specify something, I'm actually talking about this and all derived classes. So it actually creates a self-extending map that says, oh, if I ever see a derived class, I'm going to find a base class handler for that, and then not have to walk the inheritance hierarchy again. Um, that gets quite advanced, um, but the plumbing is exposed. So if I did something you didn't like, um, you could do something else or even you know, leave that piece out. The bytecodes are documented on the Freshen wiki. So you can go and look and see how the bytecode spec works. And the wiki is actually, uh, I wouldn't say comprehensive, but the documentation that's there is good and correct. And there's uh, you know, five or six sections. Uh, this is at uh, the Datomic Freshen wiki. And so you can look at the bytecode representations. You can look at how uh, the packed representations of numbers work. So 00, zero means the num numeric value and value 0. There are also packed representations for some collection and aggregate types. So for example, the bytecode D1 means um, this is a byte array of length 1. And then the following byte is you know, whatever the contents of the array are. Um, the chunked uh, representations go in the other direction and guarantee that things will not be bigger than 64K. And so there's non-terminal and terminal chunks that let you sort of break that stuff apart. Um, the byte codes are all documented, and they're in a table uh, in this uh, spec in the wiki. So if you're trying to write a conformant implementation, um, you can look at the byte codes in addition to looking at Java. So help wanted. It would be great to get a review of the initial implementation. Um, you're dependent on me getting internet access and actually putting the repo up. So I will do that uh, later today. Um, there are a couple of things that I specifically don't like about the way it works right now. One of them is that we have not done anything about metadata. This is also true uh, in Eden, right? I think Eden doesn't say anything about metadata yet. That's considered a closure-specific thing that goes beyond Eden. You know, eventually, we'd like to do metadata. The challenge, of course, is that the representation of this in every other language requires careful thought, even sort of genericizing that notion. So the reason it's not done is a design, you know, hammock time needed. Um, the second thing for which hammock time is needed is that the reference implementation for Freshen is in Java, not because we couldn't have written a fast performant closure implementation, but because we couldn't tolerate in some settings the overhead of closure itself. And so uh, it would be really nice uh, to be looking at you know, future versions of Clojure runtimes that are lighter weight. One of the things that's great about Clojure Script is that you have that division, right? Clojure Script doesn't say it does everything. 
It has specific things that Clojure can do that it leaves out. Um, I can imagine a future version of Clojure that leaves out some of the developer time uh, capabilities, some of the same things that ClojureScript leaves out, reified namespaces, eval, and whatever, and targets a leaner deployment thing that would have let us uh, write Freshen in Clojure to begin with. Uh, to sum up, Freshen is binary data done in the spirit of Clojure. And um, if you like the spirit of Clojure, which you can summarize uh, via the sort of requirements I laid out earlier, um, this may be a good fit for you for data in your own applications. And then I would end with a plea. And that is, if you look back at all the different requirements that I talked about, uh, by far, I think the most important one is the requirement that the data format be language neutral. And uh, when I talked in narcissistic, uh, narcissistic design, I talked about uh, people who are making language-driven uh, serialization decisions, right? I have some data right now. I have the hottest new library on the interwebs that says it's the fastest or whatever. It has the coolest characteristics. And one of its characteristics is it makes the presumption that my data is closure and that everybody on the other side is always going to be happy with that. That is, there are times when it's appropriate to do that. But think carefully before you do. Um, closure was designed not to be a private island. And it's a real shame if we sort of unwittingly take it back in that direction uh, by building tools and approaches uh, that presume closure from end to end on the stack. It's definitely not where we'd like to end up. Thank you. Do we do questions? How does this work? You're in charge. You have time for two questions. Are there any questions? Yes? One of the biggest costs of serialization performance in my experience is the overhead doing the copies out of I.O. Uh, like, how does, how does this compare to something like, you know, an optimized or whatever where you can do a vector router for both each thread for almost like a computer to be That's a good question. Let's go find out. So, I, you know, if, if we can do something like that without changing the, I mean, there's nothing about the, the bytecode spec of Freshen that says you couldn't do things like that, I would think. Right? You could, look, you could look directly at things. So there could be alternate, I think there should be able to be alternate implementations that work that way. Uh, I have done some of that work, but I think that, um, that the work of benchmarking is so, it's so full of, of specific assumptions that are baked in that like to say something casually would take me a day and, and to explain it carefully would take six months of my time and I, I, I can't do it. I, I, if people want it, I think it's much more important for people to test for the thing that they're trying to do. And so I would say if you're evaluating this, um, if you find some place where uh, there's something else that meets these requirements that performs better, we'd love to know about it uh, so we can address those issues. Uh, but I do not want to get into the sort of language war stuff that, that falls out of that. And uh, so measure and see. Did that count as two questions? One more, yes. So in fact, the namespaces for the closure tags is one of the open questions that we're going to answer in the next week, whether or not there will be a CLJ slash in front of all the closure specific ones or a core.closure slash. But definitely the tags support namespaces. Uh, I just chose not to use them on the slides uh, for brevity. And uh, I think probably we should be using them uh, everywhere that we're actually making stuff for real. So yes, namespace is good. Thanks.